and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we take a look at the news and top selling games from April 1985, we review the ZX Microdrive, we play some older games, we take a look at a newer title, and take a trip to Type In Corner. But first, we go back to April 1985. The official game of the movie Gremlins has been released by Adventure International. The graphic adventure sees Billy trying to save his hometown from the crazy animals and includes animation and characters from the film. Firebird are to release a compilation of games that they say are just too bad to publish on their own. The games were submitted to them by wannabe game writers, but proved just too awful. So awful, in fact, that they were funny. And so Firebird decided to release them to the public. Thanks very much. Mel Croucher and Christian Penfold, better known to Spectrum fans as Automata, have split up, with Mel leaving the company. Christian will continue to run the software house, famed for its comic adventures like Pie Mania and Uncle Groucho. A new survey by AGB Cable and View Data puts Sinclair at the top of the pile for home micro-users, with 36% of the market share. Although slightly down from the previous year, where they managed 45%, they still beat their rivals Commodore by 10%. Bugbyte Software has been liquidated, and have called in the same team that dealt with the imagined software crash. The computing veteran has been producing computer games for over three years, with its most famous title being Manic Miner. The rights to that game, though, were taken by its author, Matthew Smith, when he left the company to join Software Projects. A new type of mass storage device has been produced by Japanese company Astar International. Using a small interface, data can be stored on credit card sized ROMs that can have several functions. Some can hold read-only games, others can be used like EEPROMs, and even battery backup cards are in development. The interface required for these cards will be cheap, but the cards themselves may cost as much as £20 each. Companies like Ocean and Sinclair are said to be looking at the device with interest, and there are already interfaces planned for the Commodore and QL, and possibly the Spectrum. And that was the news, and now onto the top selling games. Coming into the chart this month is Bruce Lee, the platform beat em up from US Gold. We have Wizard's Lair, the Sable Wolf like game from Bubble Bus. It's back to the arcades for Mooncrester, the arcade shoot em up from Incentive Software. Airwolf, the game based on the popular TV series from Elite. And Booty, the swashbuckling platform game from Firebird. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from April 1985. of the Sinclair Spectrum, and other home micros at the time, was their ability to store data on standard cassettes. The same cassettes that you used to tape songs from the radio, and that were cheap and easy to purchase. Early very small programs and type-ins were rarely over 10k in size, and could be saved and loaded in around 2 minutes, usually less. Some commercial games being just 4k in size. As the games grew, and the available memory moved from 16 to 48k, loading times increased and it wasn't unusual to be waiting five minutes before you could play your favourite game. Companies tried to address this using custom turbo loaders, but this had a knock-on effect of making them difficult to load, as the read-write heads of the average tape recorder were not all aligned the same. The age of disk storage was looming too, and there were many companies producing their own systems, but the inherent cost, sometimes equal to that of the computer itself, meant the technology had limited sales. In April 1982, when Sinclair originally revealed the ZX Spectrum, they also announced a new and affordable storage medium, the Microdrive. Its initial description was of a single microfloppy, but as time moved on and the technical issues began to bite, this was changed to a single storage medium. 
this device saw multiple delays and technical problems before the public finally got their hands on it in September 1983, 17 months after it was first announced. The microdrive required Interface 1, which came with the drive in a special package, and you could also buy the drives and interfaces separately if you needed to. Early Interface 1 units often overheated and resulted in a large disfiguring patch, like mine. The problem was fixed in later versions though. Interface 1 was designed to sit underneath the spectrum, tilting the keyboard to a more comfortable angle. The microdrive simply plugged in using a short ribbon connector and you were ready to go. At the back of the interface there was a pass-through port, and also an RS-232 compatible socket. There was also Sinclair's own network port that allowed up to 64 spectrums to be connected together. The cartridges themselves were small, being just 45cm long and 35cm wide, and came in a small plastic case. Pulling this case off you could see the tape loop, and it could now be plugged into the drive. Once connected and the spectrum switched on, the commands designed to work with the mic drive were made available. The commands were a bit long-winded and convoluted, but once you'd learnt them, they soon became second nature. Formatting the cartridge took between 20 and 30 seconds, and left you with between 70 and 85k of free storage. Saving and loading data again used long commands, but it was still much faster than cassette. As with the wafer drive, reviewed in episode 2, any storage device is only as good as the software for it, and although the microdrive had much more than the wafer drive, there was still not widespread support from the software houses, mainly due to the cost of the cartridges, that Sinclair refused to drop for several months. The other problem for new buyers was transferring your existing collection of commercial software. This proved difficult due to the protection systems used. Even with commercial copiers, things rarely worked for more than one or two games. The most successful method, of course, was to use a multiface, a small device that plugged into the back and allowed any software to be frozen and saved to cartridge. This obviously meant, though, you had to spend more cash and have another device plugged into the back of your computer. Speed-wise, the device proved very fast, and I tested this using the same game that I used to test the wafer drive, Bug Bites, The Birds and the Bees. This 32K game usually takes around 2 minutes 25 seconds to load from cassette. Having transferred it to microdrive, I got this time down to just 20 seconds, which was impressive, especially when you compare it to the wafer drive that could only manage to do it in 60 seconds. When connected, the unit looks great, especially with the rubber keyed spectrum, and was high on the list of peripherals for many owners. It came into its own if you developed your own software. Loading and saving your work could now be done much faster, with less chance of errors. Sinclair were often criticised for their build quality, but these 30 year old units can still be purchased from eBay in fully working order. The cartridges though are a different matter, and have a habit of self-destructing. The small felt pads that hold the tape in place so that the read-write heads can make contact often disintegrate, leaving the cartridges useless and a very good chance of the debris collecting inside the drive itself. Overall then, a great system that should have been brought to market much sooner, which in my opinion would have changed the future of the machine and become the standard storage medium. As it is, being nearly two years late, the use of cassettes had become firmly in place, and the unit didn't do as well as it should have. A real pity, as I love this device. Just the sound of it brings back happy memories of late night programming sessions, knowing that when that whirring noise stopped, you had your data safely stored. A good piece of equipment then, which really should have done better. Escape was released in 1982 by New Generation Software and was written by Malcolm Evans. Malcolm Evans was the man who wrote 3D Monster Maze for the ZX81, which was a smash hit and probably the best known game of its time. So when the author released a 3D game with dinosaurs for the Spectrum under a new company, you can imagine the excitement. Sadly though, this is not the Spectrum version of Monster Maze, which is a pity. There's no in-depth story really, just simple instructions to tell you what to do. You have to escape the maze, and to do that you have to first find an axe. The axe is hidden from sight due to the 3D effect of the hedges, 
and the maze contains a nasty T-Rex out to get you. Viewed from slightly above, the 3D effect is quite nice, but still a little disappointing when you expected a 3D maze game. The T-Rex homes in on your position, so you have to continually move around to try and locate the axe. Once you walk over it, you have to press 0 to pick it up. Because of the chasing monsters, it may not be possible to do this first time round, so you have to lead them away. Once you have it though, you move much slower, so you have to plan your route to the exit at the top of the screen, and make sure you don't meet any dinosaurs on the way. There are five levels to the game, and you don't automatically move through them, instead you can start on whichever level you want. It would have been better, in my opinion, to let the player work their way through them. Each level introduces more dinosaurs to chase you, the number of dinosaurs is based on the number of levels you choose, and level 5 includes a flying pterodactyl, which is almost impossible to get away from. Graphics wise it looks ok, and the 3D effect works quite well, and was used by other programmers for later games. The maze is different each play, which adds to the game, and stops it becoming too repetitive. The sound is limited though, with just bleeps when you walk, and that's it. Control is via the cursor keys, which can be a little awkward on a real machine, and there's no option to use a joystick. For 1982, this was an okay kind of game. Nice graphics, and playability that would probably see you for a good 10 or 15 minutes, but that's about it. Tempest was an all-time great arcade game, released in 1981 by Atari, and is on screen at the moment. It used the same vector graphics as first seen in Asteroids, but used the new engine to allow for more colours to be displayed. Although simple looking, the maths required to calculate and draw the lines was CPU intensive, and something the spectrum was somewhat limited in. In 1987, Electronic Dreams released the spectrum version to mixed reviews. The idea was simple clear the wireways, a kind of corridor in space, from alien infestation. You move around the outside edge of the wireway, and the aliens appear at the far end and move slowly outwards. You can zap them individually, or you can use your super zap, of which you have one per level, so you have to use it wisely. If any of the aliens get to the edge, you can't make contact with them or you'll die, and the level is pretty much over, unless you have a super zap left. Clear all the aliens, and you move on to the next level. Each level, or tunnel, or wireway, or whatever you want to call it, is a different shape giving the game some variety. And the action is certainly fast and furious. Graphics wise it's pretty good, but because of the lower resolution, the aliens can sometimes be hard to spot. So you just end up flying around the arc side of the screen shooting as much as you can, until you see one of the aliens getting a little bit too close, and then you have to go and get them. Things are smooth enough with some nice effects. Sound could never match the arcade, but it's well used in this game. Difficulty is pitched about right as well I think, and you can usually get a good few wireways under your belt before things get tough. Control is via the keyboard or joystick, and reacts fast enough, and the whole thing is great to play. I really like this game, despite some magazines scoring it low, and it certainly gives a good arcade experience. I played this for ages when reviewing it, and in fact, I'm going off now to have another go. Aquaplane was released in 1983 by Quicksilver, and takes us away from the usual arcade games of the time. Picture the scene, the Cote d'Azur, 
relaxing with a perno and lemonade, and as the temperatures rise, you decide to go water skiing to cool off. What could possibly go wrong? The first thing you notice about the game is the border effect. This splits the border horizontally to give the effect of a horizon. A great effect that's not always perfect on emulators. As the game starts, you control the boat, pulling along the hapless character from the initial story. Old trees and rocks bob about in the water, and you have to guide the skier safely through them. This is more difficult than you'd think though, because you not only have to watch out for the skier, but the boat as well. Using thrust you can move forward and hopefully keep out of trouble. If you manage to stay clear of the obstacles long enough, the next level begins and the next set of obstacles appear. There are things like sailing ships and motorboats, and later on, even sharks. Each of these obstacles have their own movement pattern too, which makes navigating them slightly difficult, especially when, again in later levels, you get a mixture of them all. The animation is great, and the little skier bobs about quite realistically. Control is via the keyboard or Kempston joystick, and is nice and sharp. Sound is the typical John Hollis effect, found in many of his early games, and included in the game's creator package he wrote. They fill the game with nice effects though, and have enough variety. Playability is also good, having that just one more go feeling, and wanting to see what the next level holds. I like this game, it's a kind of pick up and play game. It can entertain you for 5 minutes or 50 minutes. Give it a try. Sector was released by Dennis Gratcher in 2013, and by his own admission, is an updated, highly improved version of Transversion, originally released by Ocean Software. The idea is simple, as is all the best games. Your goal is to clear the grid of pods by flying over them. The problem is, there are aliens out to stop you, and these fire whenever you're in a direct line from them. The aliens are continually moving too, outside of the grid, which means you've got no time to stand still. This is a fast paced game from the onset. You have to keep moving and dodging or you won't last very long. Collecting the pods is made harder in later levels when certain pods can't be moved. These stop your movement too and can only be blasted by the aliens themselves. Your ship has no weapons, so again, it's down to agile flying if you want to survive. The graphics are nice, and certainly improve the original, with plenty of colour and effects. Sound is used very well, and there's a nice tune that plays, but only when you first load the game, which is a pity really. This is a very addictive game that I found best played via the keyboard. I don't know why, I tried the joystick and it just didn't work for me, in that I couldn't react quick enough, which initially put me off the game, but as soon as I started playing with the keys, it became a whole different ball game. Once I'd got used to it, I got some fairly long games in, and once over, I was straight back in for another go. A great game then, and highly recommended.
Musical Axions was first published in January 1983 in an edition of Computer and Video Games and was written by Craig Fisher. Although the images used by the magazine show large bats attacking some poor chap on the floor, the title gives it away. Yes, it's a shoot 'em up. The listing wasn't too bad, but what about the game? We have Galaxians that look like the arcade game, although they don't move and they're not in the same formation. The game was slightly different to the famous arcade version though, in that you could only shoot aliens that were swooping, and not the ones in formation at the top of the screen. Only two of them swoop down, firing at you, and you have to either avoid them or shoot them. Shooting them, however, can still cause your ship to be destroyed. The program has a fault somewhere, whereby even if the alien is destroyed, it can still fire and destroy you, which is a bit off-putting really. There are also some graphic glitches, as you can probably see. Sound is limited, but then again it's a basic game, what were you expecting? Not a bad effort. But I think, like many typing games, it doesn't match the artwork given to them by the magazine. At the time of this video, this game is not available in the world of Spectrum Archives, and it's probably the first time it's been seen since it was published. It will be available from my blog to download, and hopefully from the world of Spectrum Archives shortly. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.